Okay, great. Well, welcome to day number three of the Employment Planning Workshop. This is, what day is today? Tuesday the 11th? 10th? No, this is the 11th of March. We're here in Las Vegas, and how's the weather outside? Nice, a little bit windy. How is the weather in California? Beautiful. Good. What does that mean? Sunny. sunny. Okay. Sunny and warm? Sunny, not, not as warm as it's going to get, but it's sunny. Okay, good. All right, so again, this is day number three of the employment planning workshop. We're going to talk about the interviewing part, <clears throat> even though this is really like day six into it. I want to start, though, by talking about just doing some housekeeping chores regarding brain rush. I saw yesterday that some of the people have done some of the brain rushes, and I think in today's event you should see that now brain rush is going to replace lumosity and brain pop. I have no doubt that some people are disappointed about that, but um, the people at Brain Rush are helping us um, customize some of these Brain Rushes or helping us to create Brain Rushes. So I anticipate that we'll be using these for the medical classes, that we'll be doing this for QuickBooks classes, that we'll be doing this for some of the other, a lot of the other classes that we offer. And uh, it gives you the opportunity to study and learn at home. So what, what is the feelings out in California? What, did you, what were the, some of the things you don't like about Brain Rush? It takes too long. Someone said it takes too long. Okay, what part takes too long? Everything. When you're in the Brain Rush? To get through one of the exercises, it takes okay. too long. That's a good point. Now, that's a good question. I had an hour phone conversation with them yesterday. Brain Rush is a different way of learning. What we have all grown up doing is you take a test and you figure out what percentage of the test you got right. If you got a certain percentage right that was considered passing, then um, if you got a, a certain number right, you passed or you didn't pass or you did great or you did poorly or whatever. Brain Rush has a different approach. Their approach is you don't finish the test or the brain rush, you don't finish it until you get it all right. You don't finish one of these brain rushes until you can answer all of the questions correctly. And it keeps going back and repeating, as you know, repeating, repeating, repeating until you get them right. So here the question is, it's, 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 it's a question of how long does it take for you to get it right? And so it's a different approach. What I would suggest is if you're doing the one like the Western states, here people had problems spelling the words, right? Like Louisiana. It's okay at the first part of the test to write down how to spell the words. That's not cheating. In Brain Rush, if you can spell the word Louisiana right, then you can spell it right. There he is. Good morning, Trevon. Uh, if you can spell the word right, you pass. It's not, we're going to see if you spell it right. If you can't spell it right, well, then you don't pass. You're gonna, you have to keep doing the word uh, Louisiana until you can get it right, or the planets. Until you get the planets right, you have to keep doing it. So it's okay if it takes a long time to get, to get it right. It's just a different way of measuring, and I think at the end of the day, though, you learn, now what we have to do is not forget. What else did you not like about it? Was it too hard? It was boring. <laughs> okay. In California. What else did you not like? I like it. Okay, well, we're going to focus on the don't like. I think that was the only one that came up. All right. So this is a different way of learning, a different way of doing things, and it's you don't get to stop until you do it right. Now, 
I had thought something, and Rob here pointed out, no, I was mistaken. So we should mark this down as the day I made a mistake. And can I interrupt you real quick? Go ahead. You keep going out of the focus. Of, you keep going like off the screen where, where you're standing. Okay. Going to the right. That's better. Yes. It's going too I look different on my screen. My little teleprompter screen is different. Okay. How's that? That's that's better. How's that? Yes. How's that? Don't feel like we're falling off. Okay, now you're gone. Okay. <laughs> right here. Okay. Great. Um. Okay, so what I thought, and I won't be, would not be surprised if they don't change this. What I thought is the second time you take the test, you can use that score. And what I learned is if you take it again, that just adds to your time. Okay? So I'm going to talk to them about that and see about uh, why they haven't added that already. Uh, because that's how video games work. And Nolan Bushnell is the inventor of the coin-op video game business. That uh, you should have your best score on there, not your worst score, or top five scores. At least, um, uh, the second one. Kind of yeah, one. and it's, it's not anything, it's not new in the game business. In the video game business, that's how it works. You keep track of your scores. Okay, so Trevon raising his hand, what is it that you want to say? I want to say it's more like flashcards than it is a video game. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, the ones that are the flashcard ones are, for sure. But like the planets isn't a flashcard one, right? I mean, there are ones that are flashcards, then there's bucket, and there's other things. So, um, uh, we're, we're going to use... So we're going down this brain rush path. This will help the school. We'll be able to have customized brain rushes to be compatible with our, or not compatible, but to enforce our other curriculum. Yesterday we started working on the memory book. Calvin, I got an email from them regarding your email to them. So they asked me to send them the book. Thank you, because of you. I sent them a digital copy of the, of the book, and they're going to have their people try to figure out how to incorporate the memory book into Brain Pops. Okay, so that's a good thing. So Calvin was creative. Can't figure out how to do it directly. Let's let's ask the people who really know, right? Well, I was asking them so I could get them to do it here, but because there was no way that we could incorporate it wrong. Else was doing it, but we still want to get into that concept of what we were talking about. Right. So, okay, so that's an example of unintended consequences. You didn't ask them the question so they would do it. You asked them the question so they would tell you how to do it. But because I had a conversation with them and talked about the book, they then said, hey, this, yeah, let's see what we can do. This is kind of a cool idea. We'll see what happens from there. Okay, so. Um, you know, there are some good things about Brain Pop and Lumosity. They're good programs, but um, I think that when we get done with Brain Rush, it's going to be much, much better. You know, we always experience that some people don't like change. See, when Trevon, when you get to start writing Brain Rushes, you're going to love it. Lumosity is. I know, but you only get like five, six yeah. screens of yeah. velocity. And we can find a way that we can have like a channel on velocity. That's right. <laughs> you can learn That's a lot more about velocity, and plus it's fun. Okay. Well, you can do Lumosity on your own. I don't think Lumosity is bad, but in our schedule, we only have a certain amount of time. Okay. Any other statements anybody wants to talk about regarding Brain Rush? I have a question, Ed. Okay. So Brain, brain Rush was now incorporated into our curriculums because we just come we just come in on Monday and brain rush is there. So what what happened or why was why was it changed or Okay, good question. Good question. Uh, number one, 
I have known Nolan Bushnell for almost 20 years. And so I have been around him. I've seen, <coughs> listened to him talk about his view of the future, where things are going, challenges that are, exist today, why systems don't work. And um, I believe that he has good ideas regarding what needs to be done to improve the systems that he cares about, he talks about. And so anytime that Nolan Bushnell has an idea, I'm going to always listen to it because I believe in Nolan Bushnell. And therefore, I believe him when he says this is a good thing. So that's one reason, just because it's Nolan Bushnell. Another reason is here in, Cal in Nevada, in Las Vegas, you know, we're working with the prison system, Department of Corrections. We have an opportunity to work with the Metro Police regarding the county jails, because the jails are full. And um, they don't really want to go the path of the LA County jails where, uh, does anybody here know what how the time is done in LA? How many days per day? 10% of the time. 10, 10 to the 1. County. Every day you serve on your sentence, every day you serve counts as 10 days on your sentence. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, for year, if you do a count a year in yeah, California. right. So you do a month. Basically, you do a month if you got a year. Okay, that's not a deterrent. They don't want to go down that path here, in, uh, or some people don't want to go down that path in Las Vegas. So an alternative sentencing is you have to go to school. We have to create a curriculum that is persuasive to the judge, and basically it comes down to. The judge that would agree to do this as a pilot project doesn't want to be embarrassed. And therefore, what we need to do is to be aligned with and allied with, allied with uh, people, agencies, organizations that are going to help make this successful. And I'm very confident that uh, Tony Shea comes forward and says, I'm behind this project. You can count on me. And if Brain Rush comes forward and says, here's what we do and you can count on us, that that will go a long ways to minimizing the judge's fear of embarrassment. And that's ultimately what it's going to come down to. There, something has to be done. There's no room in the jails here. It costs $180, $141 a day to house an inmate in county jail. It's $987 a week. Um, that's four million. There's four thousand people, so that's four million dollars a week to keep people in jail. Something has to change, and so one alternative is let's send them to jail. Let's send them to school, and you know, uh, a lot of people who go to jail or prison don't have a GED, they don't have a high school diploma, so they're not going to get into community college, and um, and Larson is a, a viable alternative. Yeah, but you have to be able to do the work, and they're not designed for that. Okay. What was the question? Javon is telling me that community college here is babysitting. Well, every community college. Is. Oh, every community college is babysitting. Community college, you don't need a high school diploma or GED at all. You I thought you did. You don't need no type of education. That's why it's a community college. Huh. Okay, is that true? I am not from here. Okay, I didn't I'm know that. Not. I thought you couldn't go to community college unless you had a high school diploma. Huh. Yeah, high school Certain ones. Go now. I guess it would okay, on. well, we'll talk community about that college. later. Community college, you don't have to go. To well, the, the idea is college. You don't get to go to college. You get out of high school. But let's move on to our subject. Or Patricia, did that answer your question? Okay. Yes, it did. It did. So we have reasons to do it. Uh, there's more flexibility. I love playing Lumosity too. I get frustrated that I get one shot a day to do it. And, um, but Lumosity isn't going to do anything to help Larson be successful. Brain Rush will. OK. OK? Yep. And um, you know, what, we, what, what uh, Rose will be talking to you about is getting some, some of the students there, perhaps you, Patricia, to help us help Green Rush help us create a curriculum 
you know, to integrate what they do into what we do. Okay. Okay. So, and who knows? That could be end up with some paid employment for people. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, what everybody has to do starting today is to do the brain rush assignments that are on there. And what I would suggest you do is not do brain pop or lumosity. Now, if you can do lumosity in five minutes, well, I don't think, but um, if you can do lumosity and brain rush, that's great. But we're going to start incorporating that into our curriculum. And also, you know, another benefit is showing the counselors here's how everybody's doing. Here's what we have. Here's this brain rush stuff. Here's how the students are doing in brain rush. You can see that they're here learning. Okay? So let's move on to interviewing. And um, you know, I want to go back to the basics. Our approach, the Larson approach to employment, is a proactive approach. It's not reactive. And what do I mean, Dave, by proactive? OK. Anybody want to help? What's our approach? Proactive Throw me a bone. Proactive to finding a job. Yeah. Oh, figuring out what you want to do, researching. OK, right. So Rob, Rob got it right. I think everybody remembers this. You know, our approach is you look for the, you identify the position you want to have as a career position, a calling or a destiny position, the place you really want to work. You find that place, you research it, and you make sure they know who you are because there is going to be an opening at that place within the year. There are very few companies that are good companies to work at that are either not growing or that people don't leave because they retire, they get sick, they get ill, they get mentally disturbed, whatever it is, that there isn't turnover. There are almost no companies that you'd want to work at that don't have turnover. But if you find a company that doesn't have turnover, don't make that part of your plan. So the proactive plan is find the place that you really, really, really want to work do your research, be prepared, get on their radar screen, so when that position opens up, they don't need to put an ad on monster.com. They call you for an interview. And if you take the reactive approach, you might see in the event, Carmen here who graduated on what, the fourth day? Carmen graduated a week or so ago, applied for a job, got the job, and they told her there were 400 people applying for that position. So the good news is they took Carmen. The bad news is if you're going on the reactive approach to getting a job, you're going to be part of the 400 people or the 100 people. I keep it down to 100, but you're going to be part of that 100 people that are applying for the same job. That's not the best strategy. The better strategy is find the place you want to work Make yourself aware. Make yourself known. If they like you, they're going to hire you. Really that simple. The woman I talked to yesterday at Brain Rush, I said, how did, you, how did you get a Brain Rush? How did you get there? She said, I was at a trade show. Nolan Bushnell was at the trade show. He was a speaker. I had the guts to walk up to him afterwards and say, I liked your thing. I started talking to him. She said, I really love to work with you. He said, let's talk, and the rest is history. Right? That is not uncommon out there in the real world. People like to work with people they like, especially in places where you'd want to work that are not the job. So the Larson approach is a proactive approach. Find a place that you'd love to work so much if you could afford to, you'd work there free, or you love it so much if you could if you, had, if you had the ability you can, and you could pay to work there, that, that's where you would work, that you love it so much that you'd do anything, pay to work there, you'd work there for free, you could afford to. Okay? That should just be the standard. If I, didn't ha if I didn't need to get paid, would I want to work there? If your answer is no, keep looking for another place. If your answer is yes, then create a plan on how to get a job there. Find people who work there, find out, know about the business, etc. So that's the that's the overall 
umbrella for our approach. It's a proactive approach to employment. But that means you need to do stuff up front. The reactive approach is easy, but it's not as good, and it's not as fulfilling. All you have to do is have a resume and send your resume out to 100 people a day and figure eventually somebody's going to hire me. I don't know who it is. I kind of know because I saw their name on, on the monster board posting or whatever. Um, don't really know about the company. Don't know if I'd like working there, but hey, I need a job. That's the reactive approach. It's simpler to do because all you need to do is spend a little bit of time every day looking and sending out your resume like the other 400 people. The second thing is the actual resume. And we've talked about that on day two. If your resume is not good, you will not get the interview. If, there are, if they have to look through 400 resumes before they decide who they're going to interview, it doesn't matter what the content of your resume is. If it looks like crap, they're not going to call you up. They're not going to read it. They don't know how good you are. So make sure your resume looks good. Now, if you get to the interview, you should be saying, aha, they probably looked at at least 100 resumes. They're probably going to interview at the most 10 people. So I deserve some credit because I made the cut. I'm in the top 10. And again, I'm presupposing this is a place that you would want to work, that you'd want to work there. You'd want to work there so badly if you could afford to, you'd work there for free. So your interview got you, your uh, resume got you in the door. What you need to understand, you should write this in your books, your resume is not going to get you the job. It is not going to get you the job. If it was going to get you the job, there wouldn't be a need for an interview. They'd say, we liked your resume so much, you're hired. Now, can anybody picture that happening? Nobody? Must they already know it. Come on, be come on. Let's stretch a little bit. California, Dennis, give me an example of where somebody would be hired on their resume without having to have an interview. In California, not listening. Who in California has an answer? No. Well, that's an answer, but you. okay. Let me give you an example. Let's say the answer is, I don't know, what are they, Fat Burger? Do they have Fat Burger out there? Yep. Yeah. Let's say Brad Pitt sent in his resume to work at, at Fat Burger. And he, in his cover letter, he said, you know what, I really have always wanted to work at Fat Burger. I don't have time for an interview. Would they hire him? Yes. Yep. There's an example. Okay. They would hire him just on his name. Exactly. Okay. We don't have that luxury. They're not going to hire us just on our name. So we have to expect that if we get an interview because of our resume, the resume was good enough to get us the interview, but not good enough to get us the job or get us the position. Therefore, what do we need to do? Travon. You need to be proactive. No, you've already been proactive. You're there. You got to do your research and. Uh, You're already done that. You're there. You need to sell them on you. Okay, you got to sell yourself. You got to get them to believe in you, and believe. The secret to selling. So we we agreed. You have to sell yourself. And the secret to selling yourself, something all good salespeople know, even if they can't articulate it is if people believe in you, then when you tell them something, they have to believe you. Well, I don't know about, I don't know that that's always true. Do you think Bernie Madoff believed in himself? He act like he did. But did he believe in himself? Well, yeah. He did? He could pull it off. Yeah. During the trial or before? I think that Bernie Madoff knew that he was ripping people off. He believed he can do it. But he didn't, well, okay, so maybe he believed in himself that his plan was really to rip people off. I think until the very end, he thought he was going to have some way to turn it around. 
and that ultimately, when two things happened, when he found it out, A, I can't turn this around, and B, I'm gonna, my, the rest of my family is going to go to prison too, that's when he decided, I'll take the bullet. I'll be the one, and I'll say nobody else knew anything. But um, so the key to selling is you have to get people to believe in you. If they believe in you, then whatever you tell them, they have to believe. Now, this is only applies when you're selling products that people don't know. If you're selling Coca-Cola, you're a Coca-Cola salesman. Do people need to believe in you? No. no. Why? Because what do they believe in? In the Coca-Cola. They believe in the brand. They believe in Coke. Okay, so that doesn't apply when you're in an interview. You have to get them to believe in you. If they believe in you, they will. They have no choice but to believe you. Now, can people believe you but not believe in you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. What's an example of that? They can believe that you can, that you may be able to do the job, but they don't believe that you can do the job. Okay. Well, that's true. That's a little bit deeper than I was going. Okay. If you say to them, today is Wednesday, and it actually is Wednesday, they'll believe you when you say it's Wednesday, right? Right. Okay. But does that mean they believe in you? Not no. at all. No, it doesn't mean that at all. But if you if they believe in you, and the question is, what day is it on the moon? So, Trevon, what day is it on the moon? Same day as it is on Earth. Okay, now if you believe in me, <laughs> if you believe in me, right? Right. And I tell you, there are no days on the moon. If you believe in me, then I'll believe what you say. Then you would believe what I say, right? And that's actually true. There are no days on the moon. Why are there no days on the moon? Because there's no time. Why is there no time? Because space has no time. No, that's not the reason. Because time is man-made. Nope. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not it. Why is there? Why are there no days on the moon? This is important trivia. Stationary uh, satellite. What does that mean? That means it's in simple it terms. It stays the same in its orbit. Sort of, but not exactly. There's a more simple, basic answer. The moon does not rotate. Oh, okay. Calls of time? Huh? Yeah, that's how we measure time. So how old is the moon? Well, we don't really know, but they think it's about three billion years old. If there's no time, there and then it fragments on Earth. No, 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 on Earth. On Earth. So we're measuring from Earth, but. If you believe in me when I say there is no day on the moon, I don't need to prove it to you, right? right? If you don't believe in me and I say there's no day on the moon, you say, well, why? Because the moon doesn't rotate. If you don't believe in me, you're going to say, how do you know? How could it not rotate? I think the moon does rotate. Okay. Okay, so then it would come down to... You don't believe me. Let's get an outside source. Let's go to Google. Right. Okay, but the point is, if you believe in somebody, if you believe in them, you will believe them. That's what you need to accomplish in the interview. Okay, it's not easy to do. You can't always do it. The people that are in HR are often trained to not get suckered into believing the person. Be objective. Don't get... Don't get into liking them. Just be objective. Try to verify if what they say on their resume equals what you what they say in their interview. Try to find out if they are liars. If they're what they put on their resume is not true. Interrogate them. But if you get people to believe in you, they will believe you. So a lot of the words in your resume should be words that have to do with being uh, believable or believe inable like dependable trustworthy honest hard working those are all words that you need in your resume okay 
but again, you're in the interview, so your resume was good enough. When you're talking to them verbally, when you're in the interview, those are things that you need to talk about regarding yourself. I'm a hard worker. I'm dependable. I make my employer money or I save them money, whatever the, the question is. You should expect that they're going to ask you some trick question or uh, a question that they would ask you to see how you would react. You know, talking about something that's in the news, say somebody that got away with stealing a lot of money and the person says, God, I, that guy's a lucky guy. I'd do five years for five million bucks and see how you respond. Right? What would you say, Trevon? Inside or out? <laughs> I'll say, um, that's not right. Somebody else's money. And I don't believe that they should take other people's things. But inside, I'll say, yeah, <laughs> okay. me too. <laughs> now, see, Trevon, unintended consequences, Trevon is bringing out another important point. We people are good at reading emotions, are pretty good at reading emotions and telling whether people are telling the truth. So it's not just what you say, and I know that Trevon would do a better job of acting. It's not just what you say, it's how much you believe, and this comes back to what uh, Telus was saying, it's whether you believe it yourself. If you say things that you don't believe, People who are good at telling whether people are telling the truth can tell when you're not telling the truth. And if you're going to work for a, a good company, a, good, a big good company, they probably have somebody doing interviews who's had some level of training to figure out whether people are telling the truth, whether what they say matches what they really feel. It's better to go into an interview anticipating that you're going to have somebody who's good at interviewing rather than hoping you're going to be lucky and having somebody that you can easily fool. And even if they don't have professional training, if they're interviewing people for their career, if part of their career is interviewing people every week, you get to be good at spotting things that aren't really accurate anyway. So if you do your employment planning, though, you shouldn't be sitting in a place where you have to lie to get the job. Now, sometimes you do, but you shouldn't have to be in that. And, you know, you should be prepared. If you have to lie to get the job, you should be prepared to tell the truth when the moment arises when you think they want you and then say, okay, and then you let out what it is. That's one strategy. You know, another one is you go with the lie and you try to somehow figure out how to make it right once you're employed. Now, for example, if you are an ex-felon and you have an opportunity to get a job, you're in the interview, but you did not check the box or uncheck the box that said, have you been convicted of a felony? You know that if you check the box that says, yes, I have, your belief is they're not going to hire me. And a lot of people say that is not, you don't have to answer the question. But the answer to the question really goes back towards honesty, trustworthiness. Can we trust this person if we hire them? We aren't going to not hire them because they're an ex-felon. We just want to know. We want to be prepared. If somebody's an ex-felon, we want to know why you're an ex-felon. Okay, it could be that. Probably isn't that, but it could be that. Now, I don't know that there's any cases where an employer would say, we don't care, we're not hiring that person. Okay, let's go with Brad Pitt. Okay, Brad Pitt went to work at home, wanted a job at Home Depot, and he'd been convicted of a felony, <coughs> and he didn't check the box, and they hired him. And then they found out, what would they do? Keep them. Exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly right. So I'm saying there isn't, I don't think there is a case where the rules would not be bent on that. Honesty is always 
the best policy. Has anybody heard that before? Many times. Okay, but I think what people think that really means is honesty is the only policy. That statement was not, the, the words in that statement were not chosen by accident. That statement is the statement because the key word in there is best, not only, not the only policy. And I know that that gets a lot of people very upset. But, you know, that's the harsh reality of life. If you're in the situation of Jean Valjean where you can steal a loaf of bread and feed your family or your family starves, how many people would say, I choose to let my family starve? If you think about it in real sincere honesty. Right. And I don't I am not familiar with any scripture that says it's better to let your family starve than to steal a loaf of bread. I'm not familiar with that. If anybody is, um, please let me know. The key thing is honesty is the best policy, and uh, all ethical systems are based upon deciding what is the greater good versus the lesser evil. And uh, going back to Socrates, Socrates said to lie is not good. But when the truth entails tremendous ruin, sometimes to speak dishonorably is acceptable. Okay? I'm here to kill your daughter. Where is she hiding in your house? How many people honestly would say, well, I'm not going to tell a lie, so, hey, Will, I'm not going to tell a lie, so uh, she's hiding in the closet upstairs. I don't think anybody, any normal, sane, rational person would do that. And you know what? Uh, the, the law doesn't say every, it's, a, it's a crime to lie. It only says it's a crime to lie in certain situations. Like if you sign something under penalty of perjury, right? Why do you think they have a thing that you sign under penalty of perjury? Because it's not a crime to lie. Unless you say, I understand that if I lie on this, bad things could happen, so I'm not going to lie. That's the crime. Committing perjury is a crime. Lying is not a crime. Now, I'm not defending lying. I'm not advocating being dishonest. I'm just saying, if we are honest with ourselves, we all know that honesty is not the only policy. It is the best policy. And when it comes to employment, if you are not trusted, if you are not believed in, they're going to choose somebody who is. So you don't want to go down the path of going into an interview being dishonest or lying. That should not be your strategy. Your strategy should be to become believed in and be believable and persuade them that you're the best person for the job because you're going you're gonna to work harder, you're going to make them more money or save them more money than anyone else. Okay, so um, I want to move on for a second. In the documents, in doc sharing under the employment uh, workshop class, and I think everybody here, it's in the shared folder, the LVC shared folder on the drive and I think it might be in Wolfpack. We have a couple documents, the 555 plan and the employment rubric. Those are documents that you should spend a lot of time with. I want to talk briefly about the 555 plan because it makes the concrete, you have actionable steps that if you do them, it will greatly improve your likelihood of getting hired. The 555 plan is You've got the first five seconds, the next 50 seconds, and the first five minutes. If you focus on doing a good job in the first five seconds, and then in the first 50 seconds, and then in the first five minutes, your chances of getting being the person who gets selected are greatly improved. So we all know, right, wrong, or indifferent, people start forming impressions immediately. We do that. That's just something we are conditioned to do. 
It's a natural thing for us. Well, maybe it's not natural. I don't know if it's instinctive. I think it's at least a conditioned response that we have. We decide, we start deciding very quickly, do I like this person or not? And it could be instinctual because in the caveman days, it could have been, you know, is this a threat? Is the rustling in the bush, is the tiger hiding in there, or is it just the wind? And so we had to be very good at making determinations very quickly about things. So we decide very quickly, do we like somebody or not? And the first five seconds are key. In your first five seconds, what you should be doing is you should have your resume out, even though you've sent it to them before, have it out that shows that you're prepared, smile, shake hands, and say how uh, appreciative you are to be there or how much you have been looking forward to the interview, something complimentary about them. I think we all know if you walk in, you're a little bit late, you're disheveled, your clothes aren't clean, your shoes are scuffed, you don't look good, and the first words out of your mouth are, man, this parking lot here sucks. It took me 20 minutes to find a place to park my car. Not good strategy, right? Not good strategy. So that's an extreme. Nobody would do that, but I don't think people put enough energy into figuring out what is the best first thing I could say. And it should be something positive and sincere. And you just have to think of different examples, but in your employment plan, it should come, you know, you should have some ideas. And in your first five seconds, you should be evaluating who you're dealing with. Is this person having a good day? Are they having a bad day? Well, let's get with the easy ones. Are they, is it a man or a woman? Are they having a good day, a bad day? Do they know what they're doing or are they learning what they're doing? Do they have an outgoing personality? Are they, are they conservative? Do they go by the book or do they look for the good in everybody? That's what you should be deciding when you go in. And like we talked about a few weeks ago, you know, imagine that you're, go you're going in with a toolbox and when you meet the other person, that tells you what tool you need to pull out of, the, out of your toolbox. Do you need a pair of pliers? Do you need tweezers? Do you need a hammer? Do you need a screwdriver? What is it that you need? What is the tool that's needed at this particular point in time? So when you go into the interview in that first five seconds or before it even occurs, you need to be thinking, okay, you know, how do I want them to perceive me? And what am I going to be looking for in them? Don't focus on yourself when you're in there. Focus on them. Get an idea of what they're thinking. I think we all agree, if you could read the interviewer's mind, you could not possibly not get the job if you're qualified for it, right? Does anybody disagree with that? If, nope. if you're qualified for the position and you could read the interviewer's mind, how could you not get the job? How could you not get the job? Because you know what they're thinking. So if they're thinking, hmm, I wonder if they're telling the truth on that, you could be, you already know they're thinking that, so you could follow up with things to persuade them that you are telling the truth. If you could tell that they're thinking, you know, I really like this person, I'm ready to hire him right now, if you knew that's what they're thinking, what would your strategy be? What would the strategy be? Hello, California, are you there? We're here. Okay, what would your strategy be if you could read the interviewer's mind and the interviewer said, I'm gonna hire the, I wanna hire this person right now, I really like him. What would your strategy be at that point? If you knew that's what they were thinking. What'd you say? What? When do I start? Someone said they would say, when, when do I start? Well, your strategy should be, okay, I need, to get, I need to get this thing over with. I've already got the job. They already want to hire me. Now I need to just shut up and let them take over. 
in sales, once you have the order, the strategy is get out of there. Yeah. Okay? Because yep. you got what you wanted. All, all the high probability at that point is something bad could happen. You might make a mistake, whatever. So you need to be focused, and when you're in the interview, you need to focus on them. You need to be confident in yourself and focus on them. So the, the two documents to have is the interview rubric and the 555 plan. So in the first five seconds, it's important. The next 50 seconds is where you have to really focus and display as best you can that you're the person for the job and be reading them to see what it is they're looking for, what is important to them. What are they trying to determine when they're looking at you? For example, are they just trying to figure out whether your resume is the same person that you are? Like in other words, they might have internally said, this is our number one choice, we're going to interview this person just to make sure that what they put on their resume is really them. Or let's say you're, you're, you're number 10 out of 10. You, you, they're only going to hire you if the other nine people are not real. Now you have a lot less to lose by being more daring. If you take the safe route, if you're number 10, if nine other people have to get passed over for you, and you take the safe route, you probably won't get the position. You know, it's like in baseball, if you're down by three runs, and the bases are loaded, there's two outs, and uh, the only way to win the game is to hit a grand slam, you shouldn't be thinking about hitting a single. You should be thinking about hitting a grand slam because that's how you're going to win the game. So in employment, if you know how many people are being interviewed, and you get a sense of where you are on that chain, then you know how daring you have to be. Question is. Yes. Can you ask the? Uh, how, hey, who would you ask? That's a good how, question, and that how comes many to. People? No, that's a good question, and it comes down to when you're evaluating this person when you meet them, and you're figuring out are they in a good mood, are they by the book, are they are they loose, or, you know how are they? If you determine, you know, this is a really good person, I could probably ask them this question then it would be okay to ask them. If, the, if, on the other hand, you get the impression from them, uh, they are the boss, they're going to do ask the questions, and they're very rigid, and they don't want you to know. They want to keep you in suspense and mystery. They don't want you to know. Then you should not ask them. And it's just some people might take it as a very good sign. Oh, this is, this is somebody who likes to be prepared they want to know how many people are being interviewed, and you can you can sort of beat around the bush and say, uh, you know, in the first 50 seconds when you're just sitting down, getting seated, and getting settled, say, you know, my expectation is there are about at least a hundred people applied for this job because this is such a good place to work. And at that point, like with Carmen, they might have said, no, actually there were 400 people. Wow, 400 people. How many did you end up interviewing? And they might just blurt it out. Ten. Okay? That's how that's one way to do it. If you determine the person is open, friendly, interested, compliment. You know, you must have had a hundred people apply for this position, or I wouldn't be surprised if a thousand people applied for this. I mean you can get outrageous. I wouldn't be surprised if a thousand people applied for this position. No, we only had 25. Wow, really? 25? Huh. I can't. I find that hard to believe. Are you interviewing all 25 of them? Or well, that must have saved time. Now you can, now you have the time to instead of going through a thousand resumes, you can interview all 25 people. And they might at that point say, "Now we're just going to inter we're only interviewing three. Whatever." But okay. It comes down to your assessment of how open that person is. And your objective, though, is to become believed in. 
That's the objective. So I'm going to wrap up with the last five is the five minutes. <coughs> By the end of that five minutes, that first five minutes, they have a pretty good idea whether they like you or not or where you fit in the chain of this is our first choice, second choice, or third choice. They have a pretty good idea of where, where you are in that pecking order. And if you knew, because you're paying attention and you're asking the right type of questions, if you knew where you were, then that tells you how much daring or conservative you have to be. Again, if you're number one and they like you and they're ready to hire you, you can throw something out like, I know you're busy. Um, I know that I know that you're busy. I don't want to take up any more of your time than than you'd like. How else? What else can I answer for you? Or, you know, what would you like to talk about next? Or, you know, just throw something out. I know you're busy, and turn it back to them. If they're busy and they like you, they're going to want to get the thing over with. And if they're if they're busy and they like you, if they're busy and they don't like you, they're going to want to get the thing over with. If they're busy, but they don't know whether you, they like you, they're going to want to go a little bit longer to determine whether that where you are in the pecking order, whether they like you or don't like you. Okay, so the 555 plan is something you should do. If you work that plan, if you know that plan, you will do well. The other important document is the interview rubric. If you focus on doing all of the things that are in the far right column, you will have the highest probability of, of succeeding. If you do anything that's in the far left column, you probably won't get the position because there will be so many people applying for that job. Okay? So we're about out of time. Uh, we can, um, we'll do this again tomorrow. We'll go over this interviewing one tomorrow because we, it's been so long since we did number two and three. So we'll we'll integrate the two together, and then, um, and we'll go from there. Okay. What I encourage you to do is please get the brain rushes done, and anybody who wants to participate in helping brain rush integrate our curriculum into their their uh, library, uh, let uh, Crystal not Crystal let Rose know or Patricia know. Uh, this is an opportunity to um, have an impact on the school. Okay? Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Ed. Okay. Bye now. Bye.